Welcome to the Worship Keys YouTube channel. My name's Carson. Glad you're here. We talk all things music theory, gear, industry, and ministry for your Worship Keys playing. I want to thank Aerospace Audio for being a sponsor of this episode. They provide high quality atmospheric pads for your performances or worship services. Uh, you can run the pads off of their app on your iPhone or iPad, or you can use their really cool atmosphere foot pedal to where the, the sounds come out physically from this pedal, which is really cool. You can check out their products on aerospaceaudio.com. So now let's get into today's episode. My guest today is Travis Dykes, and Travis is a professional bassist, the first ever bassist on the Worship Keys podcast. If you are a bassist, you don't want to miss this episode. We're talking all things sub bass, synth bass, electric bass. I got started uh, playing music when I was about five years old. I started on drums, and then eventually I started playing at church. Played a little guitar, played a little percussion. And then there was a moment that happened when I was about 12 years old. I grew up in Birmingham, this church called New Life. It's in, I think, like Trustville. My music pastor at the time was talking to somebody and was saying, like, hey, we need some more bass players at the church. All of our bass players are moving away, you know, they're moving to other ministries, whatever. We, we're just really needing some bass players. And I knew that we had, like, basses in a closet in the baptistry of the church. I, I remember I saw some in there. I was like, oh my goodness, we have like four, four bases back here. And so I asked my pastor, I was like, hey, do you care if I take one of these bases home and see if I can try and learn something that could possibly help out on a you know, midweek service or service at church? And that was kind of the thing that sparked it all because he told me after that, he was just like, yeah, of course you can. You know, he's like, in six months to a year, you could be playing a service. And I was like, man, that is a long time. <laughs> six months to a year sounds yeah, like forever. Yeah. Right, and especially, right. I'm coming from playing a little guitar and a little drums. I'm thinking like, oh man, bass is just going to be one single note, you know, whatever. Right, right, right. And, but really, that was kind of the motivation that I needed to to get going. And, I, and what I did is I, I really like, you know, studying really hard, you know, practicing a lot. And I think I wound up playing my first service in I think the first two months or so. Because I just I was just really really wanting to you know help out and play, but now Absolutely. I moved here to Nashville. Wow, it's crazy to say this, but like ten years ago. Ten years ago. <laughs> ten wow. years ago, I moved here to Nashville. Wow, it makes me feel old. <laughs> but I moved here because I had opportunities doing management work. I realized that managing was not the thing I really loved to do. Mm -hmm. I was I think the reason why I kind of wanted to do music in the first place was because it wasn't a desk job, yeah, and then yeah. I realized management is a bit of a desk job. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, and so, yeah, I have a wife now and no kids yet and no pets. That's awesome. How long have you been married, man? <laughs> Five years. Five years. Congrats, dude. <laughs> Thank That's you. Good. That's good, man. It's crazy. The first time I heard you play was for a James Wilson concert. <laughs> yeah, James. And his music is incredible. Yeah, it's and dude, You were killing it up there, man. Oh, dude. Killing it. Thank um, you. And I love your videos. He has an incredible YouTube page, by the way. Travis does. Y'all can go check it out, especially if you're a bassist. You've probably already heard of Travis. I have a Moog Sub 37, which is what yeah. I usually play like synth bass on. But before that, what I would play synth bass on was a MIDI controller with Arturia because they have like the Prophet. So that was kind of how I would get my synth sounds. If there's anybody out there who's trying to get into synth bass or anything like that, definitely you can get pick up a, a 25 key or you know, 49 key keyboard for probably less than like $500 or something. Oh like yeah, that. for sure. And then sure. like get the software and that would be less than a Moog. That'd probably be like half the cost of a Moog. Right, so. right. And it's so. funny you bring that up. Okay, so have you ever been to the the Bob Moog Museum? No. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's called the, the Moog Zim. The Moog Zim. The Moog Zim. <laughs> <laughs> or the Moog Zim. The Moog Zim. Defend, is, it's funny. They're celebrating 60 years this, oh, this year. Oh, wow. Yeah, the first Moog keyboard came out in 1964 Whoa, and i was like crazy it's like m-o-o-g right we've probably mm -hmm. seen those keyboards on stage with other bass players or keys players right just like incredible synthesizer like analog bass synth. Mm -hmm. the museum's in Asheville, north carolina that's i'm gonna have to go there i'm gonna yeah. have to do a video going there. it's like <laughs> it's amazing. in the i believe it's in like in the downtown area me and my oh, wife went cool. last time we were in in Asheville, north carolina and literally you can go through the whole museum in like 30 minutes but it's super cool because you oh, learn wow. about the analog synths and you learn about the, the components of like the oscillator and the different 
kind of waves that go through and the filter and oh, the manipulate bro. it and the amplifier and that That's... kind of thing. So I want to take a, a moment just to talk about the difference between all three bass content. So like you have your bass guitar, mm -hmm. as we know and love, and as you are incredible at, which we want to hear you play, man. <laughs> and then we also have synth bass and sub bass all within worship music. Mm -hmm. And just want to take a moment to talk about the difference between all three and how all three can be valuable. When we're talking about full band, we, you know, we assume drums and bass guitar. We mm -hmm. don't always have the sub bass. We mm -hmm. don't always have the synth bass. But in simple terms, you know, the synth bass, you still have more higher frequencies involved with the bass, mm -hmm. with a synth bass. But a sub bass is basically just that 20 to 50 hertz, mm -hmm. that sweet spot of so. the... The sub, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really love the sub bass because of these specific examples, like What a Beautiful Name or some other songs like that. When that first chorus hits, mm -hmm. you're not always hearing the true electric bass guitar. You're hearing sub bass. Yeah. Right? And so when you're in church or you're at a concert or somewhere and that first down chorus hits, right? Mm -hmm. And we're crescendoing, it's mainly just pads, piano and you hear some bass, but that bass is coming from the sub bass. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's coming from your multi-tracks. Right. Sometimes the bass guitarist is playing it mm -hmm. on their own little sub bass or synth bass. Sometimes it's the keys player who has it programmed on their keyboard to right. play down low. Yep. And it's really powerful because a lot of times it's a sine wave that mm -hmm. sub bass is. Like so full mm -hmm. in the subwoofers of the room, it's like, ah. Oh, you know? Oh, yeah. You know, I think what's so funny is that this has become a new thing. I, I remember when I was younger and I said, when I start saying this phrase, you're old. I was <laughs> like, I remember back in college. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, I was learning uh, synth bass was starting to become like a thing. Right. And I remember I was I was practicing. I was in the practice rooms practicing bass, practicing bass. And then I, I was looking. I can't remember. Um, I went to a concert or something like that. And I saw this guy playing a synth bass. And I was like, what is that? And I started looking up things about it, you know, and I was just like, huh. And then when I started coming to Nashville a little bit more, I was like, man, a lot of people play this. Yeah, and then yeah. I started seeing it on, you know, with Israel and New Breed and all these gospel artists and different things like that. I knew there's a ton of bass players out there. There's a ton, you know, of musicians that are talented, especially in Nashville. I think Victor Wooten is actually in Franklin area or something That's like amazing. that. Have so, you met him? Yes, one time. Did you one really? time, One time ever was at a, a NAM. And he was the nicest guy you ever met in your life. Yeah. And I was just like, oh. and he was like really short. And I was just like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. expecting that. I actually met him here in Nashville. He did a master class with a few people. And my neighbor actually invited me to go. Oh, really? And it was just, it was just him. It's actually his brother came to do some oh, percussion. Dude. And it was just like 30 of us in there, mainly gu guitarists, but I actually brought my little MIDI controller. Mm -hmm. And the room we were in had a little baby grand. And he was like, do you mind hopping up on piano? And, and so while he instructed, I just kind of like played with them, you know? Oh, that's and sick. As he just explained about the groove and about the feeling. And he was so inspirational. In oh, his, man. I mean, everything that you've heard of, of Victor Wooten. Like, he is that. Everybody in Nashville is so good. I'm seeing all these guys who are playing with these big artists play the synth yeah. bass thing. And, and I was like, okay, I need to probably learn how to play that. And so when I was in college, I started practicing my scales. I started practicing major scale, pentatonic scale, yes. my arpeggios. And I started doing all of that up and down the neck, up and down, I say the neck, the neck. <laughs> up and down the keyboard. And one of my friends had told me he's a keyboard player. And he, yeah. he played like, you know, synth bass. Synth bass is really fun for keyboard players because it's just like, it's more, more simple than just playing chords right you right, know right, right. so you could just have fun but he told me something that was really really helpful he said what you have to make make it feel like an actual bass mm, yeah. and that's a big thing and so something that you do on actual bass is you you actually play like when you play like a, a line um, a lot of times you get or if you're playing something groovy you do ghost notes You know, you hear like that kind of thing yeah. where it's like ghost notes that make it kind of groove. He was saying you have to do that on your synth bass too. That's good. And so he said if, if to make it feel like a bass versus just feeling like a keyboard because that, there, there has to be a difference. And so that was a huge thing that helped me. And so I started practicing that and I started learning my bass lines that I would normally play like in church or, yeah. you know, on a gig. And I would 
try to do it with the groove, try to make it groove. And so sometimes you could do that with just like, you know, just kind of like kind of touching the, the keys without like holding them down. Like right. you could kind of just be percussive. Like percussive, if you have something yeah. super high attack, you can get that little, dup, 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 yeah. you know, that kind of thing and then go to the note. And I was just like, ah, that's how they that's do how it. it's done. <laughs> that's how they do it. Absolutely. I can show a little bit of, of the difference here. I got, by the way, this is just basic main stage. These are um, all stock I'll sounds. Do. So if anyone has main stage, you can literally pull this up and go to their bass sounds. So I'm just going to play a little bit here. And at first you're going to hear like more of the sub bass. Mm -hmm. And then basically when I move the mod wheel, it lets in some more frequencies and then you hear more of the synth bass. So this is kind of like more of your sub bass content. And you still hear, it's kind of like an 808 attack there, that boom, you know? Mm -hmm. But like you're in the first chorus, you know. You know, kind of thing. And then later on, I'm gonna have to move this mic a little bit. That was a little, that was a little aggressive there. <laughs> you know, this is wide open. But like, Ooh. tell me like that bounciness, right? Yeah. I love on the synth bass using the little pitch yeah, bin yeah, too. Yeah, the pitch bin. Or, yeah, you know. Or even the, the mod wheel where it does the tremolo, like, wah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. I love that. That, that was is... like my thing. I used to love that like playing that and with the especially with the moog yes or moog what is it moog or moog so well in germany they say moog and i think in, moog, in, okay. in a lot of places here we say moog too but great britain says moog i think maybe, it's moog but it's i mean with two o's you'd think it's moog maybe i'm from great britain I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 trust me on youtube they'll probably yeah, tell they'll, us. They'll, they'll correct us yeah, <laughs> yeah no problem. tell us your correct pronunciation of moog moog <laughs> <laughs> What a lot of people do in the production world with synth basses, which you do live as well, is when you have that cut off, rolled off like that, and then you open it up, what it's almost simulating is like a riser mm, in, yeah, when yeah. it comes to production. So usually you use a riser to kind of, to build the transition going from like a low moment to a high moment. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's what a riser usually does. It kind of lifts the energy, lifts the energy, and then you're in it, you know, it that's kind of good. steps you up to it. So whenever you play in that on synth bass, it's the same kind of effect. Like mm -hmm. if you're playing playing something like dun 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 dun, dun you know, whatever you're, you're singing, and you like start rolling it off, rolling it off, rolling it off, it builds up that energy, builds up that energy, and then ah, you're yeah. in. How can keys players learn to play better in a full band context mm. with a bass guitarist? Ooh, wow, that's that's good. That's I'm gonna probably get to get on some people's toes right here. <laughs> but the one thing I didn't realize when I was learning how to play bass is that piano players, when you play the low end of the piano, like mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the infamous octaves on your left hand. Right, right, <laughs> right. That's, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that steps on a lot of bass players. And so what I started, especially when I started getting around people who are like professional keys players, mm -hmm. I noticed they never play with their hand all the way down. They always play tight. Right. They always play like here. And and that's something, uh, when I was growing up, uh, almost every keyboard player that I played with, because there's a lot of people who are volunteer musicians, keyboard players and stuff that played all these camps, and they would be playing like this, you know, they're either like this. Yeah, yeah. But then you would go to a, one of these professional concerts and the piano players are just like this. <laughs> you know, they're just like, I'm like, man, they're, they're just playing everything right there. Are they just playing one chord? <laughs> like, what's going on? Right, but right. what they were doing is leaving space for the bass frequency. Because what happens is that's how you blend with the bass better. Because if you play, if you're playing where the bass frequency is supposed to play, what happens is that that bass frequency competes with the actual bass guitar. Yes. It's the reason why organists don't play their pedals when they have a bass player. Yes. If there's anything that keys players can do to help blend yourself with your bass player is to start learning your inversions and playing in a tighter area on the piano. That's great. It doesn't mean you can't play, you know, your low in at some point, but it's more of a moment than kind of like the home, you right. know what I'm saying, of where you're going. And so that's the reason why I feel like if you start doing this, you start noticing, oh man, my bass player and me really locking in because they actually have places to play. That's good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We'll just demonstrate that a little bit. With piano players, we love to 
you know, just... Just hammer it, you know. When really, when you're playing with the bass guitarist, you yeah. know, you can just... Yeah. And just stay right here. It's great. You know, it's like you leave room, so instead of hammering, even though, like, if you're by yourself, acoustically, mm -hmm. that could feel really good. And yeah. to me, I, I feel like I'm doing more. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm making more of a statement, but you're actually doing more good for the audience, the listener, for your right. band, for your bassist. Well, yeah, and the reason why, I, and I, it makes sense the reason why most people who do that are not, like, you necessarily professionals, because... When you have a, a volunteer pianist or something like that, they usually don't, especially in a smaller church, they don't have a big band to work with. Yeah, and yeah. so a lot of times, I, growing up, I'll go to play at churches, and they don't even have a bass player. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was playing drums at churches, and it would just be me and a keyboard player. Right. And so they're so used to playing that bass part when they actually have it, they're, they don't realize that it's, you know, hurting the blend, mm. you know? And so I'm not trying to say anybody's wrong with doing that. If you're definitely, you know don't have a bass player, feel free, you know right, what I'm right, saying? Right, right, Fill right. up the space. But whenever you do, just remember, all right, let's tighten it up here. Let's, let's be in the keys area, you know That's what I'm saying? Good, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. Right, 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 right. <laughs> One question that someone submitted on the worship keys via Instagram said, how much is too much? Mm. So in the world of worship, how much is too much? And kind of mm. talk about that context as far as Base world, man. Basically, this concept that I learned being here in Nashville, uh, because I would be go to a concert or different things like that, and bass players would play, and then they'd just be in the pocket the whole time, and then all of a sudden they just throw out this lick, yeah. and it just it could be four notes, and I was just like, what <laughs> what is going on? Every single time. I, it would just hit me, and I was like, "Why? Why, why is their lick just like hitting me in the gut right yeah, now? Yeah. Like, it's, it's not even anything crazy. I've heard people play crazier things, but it's all about placement. Mm. It's all about placement. There's a balance that happens when you play music, and so the whole point of a song is not necessarily for your part. It's for the betterment of the song. Mm. And so when you understand that, and like especially in a worship context, is like I, when I play, I never want to distract somebody." from the words, yeah. especially in a church context. You start seeing people really getting touched by a song and starting to worship, coming to the altar. You know, you don't ever want to be that person that takes them away, away from that moment. Mm -hmm. What I start recognizing is like, okay, I don't need to do something here, but I do need to do something here because it's not, you know, it, it needs more energy, you know, or something yeah. different. Design. And so when you have that basic foundation, it starts you into that. But my theory with it is, and this is something I've learned from just being here in Nashville and being in the, the scene for a little while, is that everybody who usually plays a lick and it hits you in the gut, it's always like you play a lick on the second time you do a section, okay? So that's just a good way of doing it. Second time you do a section. So like, let's say you have a, a, a song, starts off with the intro, verse one, pre-chorus, chorus, okay? So in that particular section, I'm not doing any licks really because the whole idea is that the listener is learning the song yeah. so it, no matter if you've heard the song a million times you are still learning the song anytime you first hear it your ear is yeah. and so what happens is that whenever you're listening and going through it you're having to relearn okay that's what that feels like and then when you go to the second time through like the second verse when you throw a lick in that second verse their ear is like oh we're going back to the section mm -hmm. I already know this section so when you add something you know a little lick or something now it's like ooh that's new. That's good. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And that's kind of the, the idea behind it. And so even when you go to the second course, if you add something on that second course, it's a little, just a little lick. It will be like, ooh, that's new. And versus like, if you did that in the first course, in the first verse, yes. people, people's minds and people's ears are like, oh, is that a part of the song? That's good. You know what I'm saying? Is that a part of the song? And if you, if you start thinking about that, then it helps you to kind of know, okay, I need to save my licks 
I need to play my pocket and maybe add something here. Still doesn't mean you should go nuts, you know, whenever yeah, yeah, yeah. you shouldn't be doing, you know, all 12 keys, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> when you do your lick, that's just how you parcel it out so you know that you're adding to the moment versus taking away. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's great, man. I love yeah. that. What advice would you give to the bass player who doesn't know how to play any licks at all? Like, what advice would you give them to start learning how to ad lib a little bit in mm. the bass world, man? So, the biggest thing, and honestly, this is, I, and this applies to every instrument, but bass so so heavy with this. But feel mm. is everything. Yes. If your feel is not good, I wouldn't even try to start. You know, doing you know, extra licks and things like that. Of course, it makes it more fun for us when we're creating and things, but if the feel doesn't feel right, then you're not as effective mm. in the first place. So that's like, okay, the feel doesn't even feel right, so why should you even do a lick? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you wanna add to, you don't wanna take away, and if the feel is not there, then you're actually taking away from the actual song. So like if I'm playing something, so like that, so what, what was that, Goodness of God? Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing, so right now I'm just kind of muting with my left hand to kind of give it more of like a muted tone or feel. And I'm also plucking a little bit more towards the neck, which kind of gives it more of a round tone. So if I go here, it kind of is even more round. If I go back here, it's got more attack. And so basically what happens is that because I'm choosing to play in this area right here, it's making the feel feel right for the CCM type song. Now, if I was playing something where it's like more gospel, uh, you know, I, I would probably go back a little bit. You know, like, yeah. because there's a little bit more attack on the back end. And so that's the reason why that feel, even if I don't have any licks, that could just make you sound like a 10 times better bass player. Yeah. Now, if you want to start getting into some licks, I would definitely start with the pentatonic scale. Pentatonic scale is a great one. That was all pentatonic. But what's beautiful about pentatonic scale is that you can play over a lot of different variations of chords. Because if I start playing like color notes, You know, like then it's just like you're starting to get these more chordal tone tonalities and stuff to the chord. And so it's more particular of like what notes you can use. Mm -hmm. And so, but with pentatonic scale, it's just like, oh, it, it'll work as long as it's in the right key. That's good. And so if you're interested in starting to get into it, learn the pentatonic scale. And just as, this is just a little addition, something that has helped me over the years is sometimes people could say that and they'd be like, okay, yeah, learn the pentatonic scale. You know, and it's just like, how do I use this? First thing I would do, learn how to play it all the way through all your strings, okay? And then learn it how to play it all the way up the neck using positions. You do this probably on the same on keyboard right, as well. Right, yeah. Learn all your positions all the way up. And then this is my whole thing when it comes to learning anything with music. Pentatonic scale can seem like a really big concept. But whenever you take any concept, this is what I always think, I use this method called the shrinking method. Basically shrink it down to a smaller bite size amount. So even though like you can learn all these different scales, all the way up the neck, what you need to do is now shrink it down. It's like, okay, I always tell my students this, D and G, play on just the D and G string and start to try to create your licks just based off of that. Because now you get more creative ideas. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I messed up on that one. But, but the thing is, is that you, you start to get these ideas and your, your mind can actually grasp it more mm, because yeah. you're, you're taking a little small amount. And so you can start in the D and G string and then go to E and A string. You could even just try it on one string because what happens is that if it's too big, it's hard for your mind to be creative. But if you have something that's just like, okay, I'm just gonna shrink this down and bring it down to a more bite-sized level, 
then it's just like, oh, okay, yeah, I could use this in this way. And then you actually master the technique. That's good, man. That's great. And same thing in the keys world. You take the same concept of pentatonics five, right? Penta five. Mm -hmm. You have the one, two, three, five, and six. You're just everything except for the four and seven on your scales. And so that's your major, right? That's your pentatonics, right? And you can position your hands like, like A minor seven, C major six, and keep walking down like that. And you, you form your hands like that for your fingers, and then you do it individually. And you keep going all the way down. And keep doing that in every single key until you've got them all down. <laughs> and then you can also do some cool licks in the piano world. But talk about when people do licks within a band, how do you know that the guitarist or the keys player isn't about to do something cool and you're not about to interrupt what they're doing. How do you find that pocket between the people that you're playing with, even your drummer, who I'm sure you're locked in with on mm -hmm. their kick? Like, yeah. how, do you, how do you have that collaboration and that cohesiveness within your band members? I've played with a lot of different styles, like you know, with me and just a singer, like bass and just a singer, or me wow. playing acoustic. And really, bass and, and a singer? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, it's, yeah, it's a different experience. It's a lot on your <laughs> plate, but, but all, all the way from that to playing with like a 15 to 18 piece band, you know, yeah. with the orchestra and stuff like that. Yeah. It, what I've learned is that a lot of people say chemistry is like something that's like, oh, I have a good relationship with this guy, so my chemistry is there. Which that is true. That I do think that you can have some chemistry of having fun on stage, different things like that. But when it comes to really knowing when somebody's going to play a lick, it comes through listening. Mm. And so I, I've learned, you know, there's a drummer, I think I've made a post on Instagram uh, from a couple of years ago. There's this new drummer I was just playing with. We were playing these, this really hard music. And I was just, everybody was like, man, you guys are so locked in. How did you, how did you know like he was going to do that? How did you know he's going to do that? It's because we were both listening. Mm, that's good. And so, and especially doing rehearsal, because most times you're not going to go on, especially if you're at church, you're not going to go on the platform or the, the stage and play from, without a rehearsal. Right, And right. so when you're listening in rehearsal and you're listening, oh, this, he's trying to do this. Okay, let me not do this here. Okay, oh, okay, let me try and do this. And, and if they're listening too, then they'll be like, oh, okay, he's trying to do that. Let me either back out or let me try to em emphasize it. That's good. And so what starts to happen is that your chemistry starts to get there and you start to know, okay, this person's going to do this here, you know, this here. And if now let's say you're the person you're playing with is not skilled and don't know like that you're possibly going to do something, I would just tell them, it's like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this bass lick here. You know, do you know if anything you could possibly do to kind of help it? Or, or do you think you could, you know, stay out like what do you think will help you know help with this moment yeah. and that and what that does it kind of keeps it less um about you know hey get out of my way <laughs> <laughs> versus versus just like you know hey we're working together on this yeah, yeah and great. so whenever i play live recordings that that's always the thing it's like we're in rehearsal and we're listening and i may come up with something and then keys player would be like hmm and then he may yeah. come up something right after that. And then when we, we do that in rehearsal, and then if we don't, if we kind of step on each other's toes sometimes, then we just say, hey, I was thinking about taking it right here. And, and then I'm like, oh, I'll take it right before that. That's good. And then that's how you start to find those little, those pockets of spaces where you can play licks together. I love that, man. I love yeah. that. So what kind of advice can you give to bass players who want to play more slap bass? When do you do it? How often do you bring it in? Tell us about mm -hmm. that, man. If you ever play anything with like gospel music or anything like that, having a brighter bass or an active style bass is very, very important. Now, in the worship world, it's P basses, you know, jazz basses. There are active jazz basses that sound great, in which this is pretty much a jazz bass body, but it has some different, you know, REJ5 pickups, which is a bass mods. It's, it's from this company called Bass Mods. I don't know if you can see the head of the bass, but it's from Bass Mods. And basically, it's a jazz bass body with a, a neck, and it's active. It has two, if you can see on the back here, it has two 9-volt batteries. I'm, I lost the cover of, you know, one of them. <laughs> but it powers, and it has a preamp right here, which has like a master volume, pickup selector, mids, highs on this top knob, and then lows on this bottom knob. Okay. And so it kind of gives you an EQ and a power EQ, and what happens is that Oh, and it also has this passive, active passive switch right here, but I'll show you a second. So when you have an active bass, 
it sends a lot more volume but let me pull off this the uh, knob right here which takes it to passive the volume is like half or less you right, know right. which is what a normal passive bass would sound like and so that's the reason why whenever you hear different bass players who play gospel their stuff is like <laughs> It's like super poppy and super bright. It's because most times they're playing a active bass. Now, if I, if I did the same thing on a passive bass, like a P bass or something, it definitely not sound like that. Yeah. <laughs> it would sound like more muted. I don't, now, I can't really, this, this is not like a true, true passive. So it's just, it, it's getting the volume. So like, even though I did the passive, Nah, but you still hear the high end because that's just what the preamp is on this. Right. Now, if you didn't have this preamp, it wouldn't be that bright. <laughs> it wouldn't be that bright at all. I would say when it comes to slapping, uh, <laughs> there's so many things, so many things that come to mind because everybody used to always make the joke of like, oh, slap of the bass man. <laughs> like when I started playing bass, yeah. that was the joke every time from everybody. Oh my gosh. But and I used to kind of be really reluctant to learning how to play slap, but but then I started realizing oh this is a lot of fun actually yeah, when yeah, you don't yeah. have to do it in the right context. But I will say if anybody is on here you're wanting to learn how to play slap, don't try to add it to worship songs. <laughs> I I mean unless it's like a Planet Shakers or right, or oh, like a Hill Shakers. song, Young and Free, you know, yeah, do it then. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah. whenever it's like you know. Was it a, what a beautiful name, it is, what a beautiful name it is. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like, no, it sounded like I'm in the, in the 90s or something. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right, 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 right. Which that was, that was kind of, at the time, that was, everybody was like, yeah, slap yeah, yeah. the bass, yeah. <laughs> no. If you do that, I'll, I'll definitely be cutting off the song. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but the thing is, is that slap is very, very fun on bass, yeah. and you should definitely do it. But just learn the right context of using right, it. Right. So, it, like, what's that song? Alive. Uh, what is it? Hill Singing Up Free? Okay, so something like that could totally be a, a cool slap line because it's kind yeah. of like that young it is it, it's, it's not like it it's not like worship where you're trying to be careful how much to take away it's right. like fun and so what happens with slap is slap actually gives it energy that's the way i think about slap so yeah. if i'm like You know, like Woo! that kind of that kind of whole yes, thing. <laughs> but that but that's where you want to use slap. You want to use it to build that energy versus yes. like take away from the the what a beautiful name. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 People right. are you're just like, what a beautiful name. And then somebody just starts slapping and you're just like <laughs> you're just like, oh, okay. All right. right. <laughs> no. Have you ever played a cool arrangement of either like Glorious Day or I Thank God that starts off your normal <laughs> CCM vibe and then all of a sudden y'all you, flip. Yeah, and it so, goes crazy. Was you, what was that first one you just said? It was Glorious a, Day. Glorious Day, yeah. There's a one that I did when I did this tour with James. I think All Nations Worship in Atlanta. Yeah, they, they have a great arrangement of Yeah, those. I think they, we were doing their version where it's like, uh, when they go into that... So what I usually do on bass when I've played this... Now they have this drum cup that comes like, uh, and then I follow the mel melody. Yes. Which honestly, if you're a bass player, if you want a cool way of doing a lick that's very tasteful, follow the vocal melody. Oh, I love that. That like the vocal melody, it really just makes everything. So it's like. <laughs> Like that's that's usually and that's usually where I add like something, Ooh, you know, like yes. just kind of like an addition to 
the the whole the whole line it makes that lick stand out now so because good. now I'm just following that that vocal melody and you're like oh yeah that's the vocal melody so you know good. and then oh whoa all right it's a bass <laughs> you know it's like then it's just like okay <laughs> But no, that's, so awesome. yeah, I love doing that arrangement. It's funny whenever the gospel world gets a hold of a CCM song. <laughs> it's, it's like Goodness of God. Goodness of God was originally, was that Hillsong or Bethel? Or, or I think it was maybe, uh, oh, I, you, yeah, uh, I can't remember who, good, who did Goodness of God originally. I think that was Bethel. Was it Bethel? Yeah, it was Bethel. So like Bethel originally did Goodness, did goodness of God, and then... CC Wine and gives it, and it's just like this new hit song in the gospel. Right, right, <laughs> right, like, right, right. Oh, the song's already been around. Yes, <laughs> it's just like, yes. but it's now you start getting the gospel flavor, you get the gospel voice, you start getting, you know, even the, the blessing. Yes. Um, the blessing was one of those too, where it was like, it was originally CCM, and then yeah, the gospel, they have the gospel version of it, and it's just like, you know, yeah, like, a whole like, new level. A whole new level. It's crazy, man. Yeah. I think, um, before C.C. Winans did Goodness of God, I think, didn't Israel? He probably did. Did I think Israel did, did a, a version of that. Yeah. So you've talked about passive and active things. Talk about the pedal board situation. I used to be really reluctant to pedals whenever I was get, first getting into it. But I've learned, being here in Nashville, being around a lot of different styles of music, it really just depends on what style of music you're trying to play. Mm -hmm. Gospel, you can use some pedals. And I always have this thing is like, Go quality over quantity. Yeah. And so if you have, if you're going to get pedals, you know, get quality pedals. Don't get, you know, the $50 Timu special. <laughs> you know, like, get, get like, you know, something that's actually going to be good. The one that I've always used for years now is the API Transformer LX. And basically what it is, is a compressor and EQ. And, and really it's a preamp too. The EQ really kind of doubles as a preamp. And it's my DI, so it goes from quarter inch to XLR out to the system. Yeah. Now, I'll, the reason why I love it so much is because it just sounds really, really good. And so that's the reason why I, that's been like the main pedal I travel with, because no matter where I go, no matter what pedals I play into it, it's going to sound good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So now if I get like a distortion, you know, or if I get a... I don't know why I would need a reverb, but like <laughs> if, unless I'm soloing or something, um, or even like a fuzz pedal or, you know, an octave, if it, when it goes into that pedal, it's mm -hmm. going to sound more saturated. It's going to be a little bit more compressed. It's going to have a little bit more of a, a, a greater tone. So if you're thinking about getting into the pedal board game, start with your preamp in, you know, DI pedal, you know, that is going to be what you want to spend the most money on. Get, get a really good version of that because then even if you go a little cheaper on like your effects special you know effects and things like that it will still be going through passing through something that's really good so do you do the same thing with keyboards when it comes to making a pedal board i've seen keyboard players use it in the past. do you have like a di or how does that work so a lot of keyboardists will do like very small pedal board everyone loves the blue sky pedal mm. And Drew Pickens, who was just on the podcast, he actually uses a pedal. It's like, <laughs> and it's like aerospace is what mm. it's called. And it's basically like this built-in pad that is like an extra oomph to yeah. his layers on the Nord. So I've seen a lot of people use the Blue Sky and a basic like EQ or compressor and That's like cool. the aerospace. One of my friends, his name is Louis Pacheco. He's like a YouTuber as well and a yeah. musician. He, he showed me this thing where he was... I guess basically making a regular, some kind of Yamaha keyboard sound like a Nord just with a pedal board. Wow, really? And I was just like, that's actually really, really cool. I think that's part of the reason because when you look at a Nord, it's kind of laid out like a pedal board almost yeah, because yeah, yeah, you have yeah. your compression, you have your you know keys, your scent. Like it's pretty much like if you, you can just get pedals of each of those things and make right. your own. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's a good <laughs> way is, to think of that. Yeah, no, and as, that's kind of that's just funny when you said that. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess that is true. <laughs> yeah, but on the software route, you know, you can build your whole pet, virtual pedal board mm. and get tons of different effects oh, dude. within your software. That's, that's what I do with main like, stage, man. Like presets and stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, do you yeah. use like a controller? I like do, a, yeah, the Korg Nano controller, or with this Arturia Key Lab, which I use a lot of Arturia mm -hmm. sounds. It already has knobs and faders that will already be programmed uh, gotcha. with what I'm doing. So, you know, but the Korg Nano controller is a great option. That's super cool. I think yeah. I just got that same exact 
keyboard. That's an 88 really? key Arturia. Yeah, 80, yeah. Was it the Key Lab? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just got the the black version of that. Nice, bro. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. That's super cool. Yeah, it's a it's a great controller. I think it's one of the best MIDI controllers mm -hmm. out there. And I like how this one's fully weighted, so you mm. it really feels like you're playing the piano. You know right. what I mean? I think, I mean, they have a semi-weighted as well with the right. 60, I think it's the 61. Yeah, I remember seeing that one. You know, and that's cool for like synth stuff. And I think when you're doing synth bass, it's nice to have a lighter key bed, but. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but whenever you try to play synth bass on like a fully weighted hammer action keyboard, yeah, it just, it's not fun. It doesn't. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. it's just like. You get in a workout and it's just like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Dude, and one thing you can't do on the keyboard or, or synth bass are the slides. You can slide to a certain degree, you know, bow, you can bend the pitch, but talk about slides, man. Like, mm. I love it on certain uh, bridges or certain parts of the song where the bass is not in yet and all mm. of a sudden they go, doom, and they, they slide in. Like, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? So... I have so I actually wrote a bass book, and one of the the parts of the chapters of the book was talking about slides. And most times you don't see that in a, a book, a bass book, or anything like that about slides. But slides are such an important thing when it comes to to playing. And honestly, the big difference, the reason why I, I know, I remember a, a lot of older guys who you know been playing bass for like 30, 40 years. They're just like they. Whenever the synth bass came around, they're like, "Oh no, it's going to be com computers. Computers going to take over." My way of thinking about it now is that when you play any instrument, even if it was just the bass, the big thing that the bass brings is human touch, a mm. human touch. And yeah. so, like, whenever I play, you know, I if you have a play a note or play a scale or anything like that, I try to avoid always just playing like. You know, like two perfect and two is just like robotic right, because right. that's what the keyboard is going to do. Yeah. And so one way that you can do that as well is with slides. Slides, what it does, it kind of gives that feel like if you're like. You know, like that kind of yeah. doing that whole thing. Now, a way that I use slides, and I talked about this in the, the chapter of the book, is I use it as transition. So just like we were talking about with risers and how you can like put the cut off and you, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, you do that whole thing. <laughs> I was actually impressed with that. that was <laughs> yeah, I actually yeah. got it. Are you a DJ no, too? No, like? no, <laughs> no. But that whole idea of risers and building your transitions on bass, you can do that with slides yeah. as like a way of transition. It may not be like a you know, like, you know, like you're not doing it that slow, but what you could do, I'm trying to think of a song. So, so let, let me go back to that. Okay. So let, let's say you're going to the next part. You so like, that's how, that's how I'm going back into it because yeah. It, it kind of transitions that moment. It gives it the human feel because if you just play, it's not as so much life to it. Yeah. But when you, now I'm adding ghost notes. Like that, that's how whenever you start doing that, it feels like more like a human's playing this yeah, versus yeah. like a robot. So <laughs> you know? That's what the keyboards are trying to em emulate with that is like, you know, that little, the, the mod wheel. Yes, that's yeah. what they're trying to, or the pitch bin mm -hmm. of the mod wheel. Like that's what they're trying to emulate. But there's just something about like a bass what, or, or guitar or whatever, when you actually just slide and do it as a human or even, I know like I've done it on a MIDI board before, whenever I was producing a song, I would play and then I would just like slide all my keys. I would oh, see keys yeah. players just like, you know, do that. <laughs> and it really was funny. It's is organ that, technique. You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it gives it human touch. And right. that's the reason why, like, whenever you play live, people love the 
hearing people live is because it's like that hum humanity connecting to community essentially that's good, that's good. and so it's like whenever you're doing that you feel the energy more because there's a human behind the instrument yeah, yeah. and so that's the reason why like you could listen to something on spotify listen to something on apple music you know and not connect with it as much as it was in the moment that's good you know what i'm saying right so anyways that's so good bro <laughs> so what's your favorite type of music to play who are your favorite bassists and why i will say gospel is fun but i think i probably like playing like pop r&b style or soul style nice. uh, music just because they have really good bass lines mm. a lot of times you know pop stuff is fun because it's open and so like just this whole you know this is kind of a popish bass right, line right. but the reason why it's so much fun is because you can do all kinds mm -hmm. of kind of stuff over it so you know like that kind yes, of like stuff or whatever yes. but like that's kind of the idea of the reason why i like pop you know now when it comes to bass players that i love now this is going to be a probably a person that nobody's going to expect for me to say but everybody respects pino palandino uh, you know he played he's played on d'angelo he's played with yes. the who he's played with the john Mayer trio man that is like my guy like i've really? never met him before i would love to meet him one day but that is like huge influence huge influence him awesome. huge influence justin rains is another huge influence he's played with israel new breed nice. uh, william mcdowell a lot yeah. of you know huge people he's just like a really really huge inspiration victor wooden of course victor yeah, wooden is, so good. is everybody's inspiration i hope yes. <laughs> you know? do you listen to dirty loops oh yeah yeah, yeah. dirty loops Dude. That bass player is incredible. He, I saw them when they came to Nashville just this spring. How was it? Was it crazy? It was so good. Oh my it gosh! Was absolutely incredible. No, I love but them. but I think that's probably probably my influences. Uh, my top three. A few more questions. Do you ever use a pick? Do yeah. you have any advice on the pick? I actually, I think I have one in my wallet. My, uh, okay. My wife keeps. My wife is a, a songwriter, nice. and she always plays acoustic and you know things like that. And we have this battle of the picks at home. She was just like, well, I need to get, you keep stealing all my picks. And I'm like, Caitlin, I literally have, you know, my own set of two or three picks. <laughs> like, I'm not using them all the time. Right, but right. anyways, I think I have one in my, my wallet. When it comes to using a pick, a lot of people used to frown at using a pick, but I actually think it's super sick. Okay. But it's really when you're wanting to get more attack from your bass. Or you could just grow out your fingernails, right? Yeah, you could do that. Grow. <laughs> well, actually, you know Randy Jackson. Does Randy he do Jackson. That? I remember seeing a video from back in the day. He was teaching bass or something. Yeah. And he was saying he grew his fingernails out, and that was how he get that picked sound. That was kind Crazy. of the secret to his tone was using his fingernails yeah. instead of like a pick. And I'm like. Wow, I've had that happen where my fingernails like have gotten really long and that I'd done that. Mm -hmm. And I just hated it. It just didn't feel good. <laughs> I, didn't like, I didn't like the tone of it. Yeah. But I use a pick, you know, most times uh, whenever I'm trying to get more of an attack on it. It kind of gives you really a harsh attack. If you play gospel with a pick, it'd be tough. It gets like just like a lot. You know, like it gives you more of a like an, an almost like a like a ghost note action that's a lot harsher. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool if I was playing like something kind of indie, like or if I was like. Now, the big thing with it that I do is you probably notice that it sounds, it doesn't sound like I'm just ringing out, like, like ringing out like that. Right. What I'm doing, and this is a big thing when it comes to feel, I just do it naturally now, but I have my hand, my fingers doing what we call a left hand mute. And so what happens is that I'm playing this with a pick, but I'm using my left hand mute to kind of tame it. So it's not like all kind of crazy, it's just like more subdued. Yeah. That's how you're getting that 
kind of more muted and kind of just more chiller tone where it feels controlled yeah. versus like just out of control. Right. <laughs> because right. I think that's the reason why the pick has gotten a bad name mm. because it's just like you hear people just like, <laughs> you know, it's just like going nuts. But right. they, they're not like ever just playing it controlled. Mm. But when you play it controlled, it actually could be a really, really sick tool when it comes to playing bass. There was a event that I played. It was like this big stadium and they had a bass solo. It was like, I can't remember, it was a Planet Shaker song. I can't remember what the name of the song was, but it had a solo in a bass solo in it. Literally, awesome. what worship song has a bass solo in it? <laughs> well, that's that's probably... Sounds J- like Planet Shaker. Jo- Josh Hamm probably, you know, oh, yeah, 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 Josh yeah, Hamm yeah. was probably, that was probably his doing. But no, thank you, Josh. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, to have a bass solo is amazing. I had like some distortion and an octave pedal, and I did like this... Was it? You know, like that was what I did. Yeah, and I, yeah. I used the pick, but we, as soon as we came out of it, I went back to fingers and I just like tossed my pick and I just went back to me. <laughs> but, but yeah, I have used it in a worship concert. I don't use it as often as I probably would like, just because the, the worship music I've been playing here recently is like more kind of tame. You yeah, know? right, right, right. So yeah, it really is a creative tool. I love that. You know, and I think when it comes to playing any instrument, you don't want to throw away any creative tools. It's because I think that's what makes it unique to your sound. Whenever I first started playing bass, the first bass that, remember I told you that my pastor asked me, or said I could borrow a bass from the church, I brought this four string jazz bass. That didn't really, I didn't really know anything about bass work or anything like that. It was this four string jazz bass that only went to the fifth, like the intonation was so bad, you could only get clear notes from the fifth fret down. So like up to the fifth fret. Wow. And it was a four string jazz bass. And what I started learning, because I'd, anytime I'd go past there, it would just be like buzz, 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 buzz. It was like maybe a truss rod thing and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know it. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew the bass couldn't do it. So what I, when I first learned how to play bass, the first year of me playing bass, I only knew how to play in the first five frets. Mm. And that changed the way that I play as a, a player. And that's the thing is your limitations really it was what brings out what's unique about you. And also brings out, it's, it's your greatest strength when it comes to it. And honestly, me doing that and learning how to play like that has been a huge help to now the way I play, I can play here, play here, play here, play here. I'm thinking about it in five fret form versus like, you know, you know, just, just my major scale, you know? And so with that, it's, Sometimes these creative tools are denied when really they can on- honestly help you stand out and be unique in your own, you know, voice. That is great, man. That is yeah. great. One person uh, submitted the question, one of my buddies, Matt Powell, he said, why are the bassists always the coolest people on stage? <laughs> you know, what's funny is probably because we know that we're having fun <laughs> and we don't have to, to worry about like, doing all the crazy solos and we could just chill. I think, I think that's probably honestly, because <laughs> sometimes I'm, I'm, I've played in a um, jazz context and like everybody's doing the solos and I'm just like, just in my pocket. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm having fun because I'm playing, I'm playing four notes and you're playing 50. <laughs> and, and so I'm just like, I'm not worried. I'm just locking in to the group. And that's just honestly, that was, um, I remember a friend of mine told me that. She's like, man, I always love bass players because it just seems so cool. Absolutely. It's just because I think you're just, you're just chilling. You're That's chilling. Awesome. Because the thing is with bass, the amount of accuracy you have to have is a lot higher than any other instrument, really. Because if I play a wrong note, it's going to make your chord sound wrong. Right. If, if I play a wrong note or play a, a note that doesn't work, it's going to make the guitar player's part not sound right. It's going to make the drummer sound like he's not locked in. When you're just sitting in that pocket, it's still extremely important. But it's like the likelihood, and that's the reason why you see a lot of bass players who are really good. They don't do a ton of licks, you know, because they know as soon as I mess up, it's going to mess somebody else up. <laughs> and so that's the reason why you have to be more pocket when you play bass, because you're sitting there and you're just going, and it's just like if you lock in and make that feel good, then you're doing your job well. 
And then if you, you know, eventually want to add a spice to it, then it doesn't have to be a lot. You don't want it to take away because you don't want to take away from, you know, what you're actually doing, what your actual job is. Per so se. good, Travis. So good, so. man. I appreciate you sharing all this on the podcast today, man. Yeah. One more thing before we go. What is your best advice to anyone beginning to learn the bass? People always say when it comes to learning bass, that it's the easiest thing to pick up, but the hardest thing to progress on. Mm. That is so, so very true. Because when you first do it, it's just bass notes. It's just, you know, you're playing your roots, you know, you're just following the, the chords of the piano player. But then the kind of the transition has to be, okay, how does this affect everybody else? Because I feel like every bass player gets to this wall where it's like, okay, I know my, my, my scales, I know how to play these songs, but how do you know how theory relates to the songs that you're playing? Mm. That's a huge key that I, I, when I started learning that, changed my life, changed my life completely. Because then it's, it's not just about, okay, am I playing the right note for this song? It's more so like, okay, this song is doing a 6415, and I can play a 6415 in all these different keys. Or I can play this little, you know, in every, every key. You know, I can use that as a, a different lick or phrase that I can use in everything. Yeah. So I think relating it to music theory, music theory is definitely very, very important, but it's the relating it to what you're playing. And if you're a church bass player, if you're a church musician, that is the one big key. Find how the theory works with the songs you're playing because then once you connect that you actually grow in your knowledge and not just being a cover band <laughs> you right, know right. Like, where you don't really know what you're doing you you want to be a musician that actually has depth now if you're a bass player and you want to get better at bass definitely make sure you know the number system extremely extremely important uh, i was actually somewhere not too long ago and nobody knew the number system and i was just like oh man you know it's so crazy because in the professional world, that's all there is. That's all there is. Yeah, right, right. Literally, there's that. There is no, nobody's calling like, "Oh, I'm doing an A flat minor seven sharp." The fifth, you know, like <laughs> now they may do that if it's a, a keyboard player they're trying to communicate with. It'd be like, "Oh yeah," I'm, but they may be like, "I'm playing a, a one major seven flat the fifth. They're not pl not saying A flat. You know what right, I'm saying? Right, it's, not, right. it's not that there's anything wrong. There's a reason why you have that. But in the context of you know being a professional musician or just going somewhere where it's a universally used communication, you know, tool, yes. it, it really, really changes everything. And the other way it changes everything for you as well is when you know the number system, let's say I was just playing that, you uh, oh, I'm not even right I'm playing this. Okay. I'm playing, if I'm thinking, I'm in the key of D as in dog, and then all I'm playing is a six, three, four, four, six, five. Now, now that I know this on a number system, it doesn't matter if I transpose it. It doesn't matter if I go to another key. So let's say I want to play this in, let's say F. Now I'm just gonna do. Cause this is just a six, three, four, four, six, five and F. And so when I learned this, this whole concept of this and started doing it, I was like, man, I actually started to, all the songs that I would learn, if I, if there was a special lick or something, like if, if I was back here and I did something like there was like a, so that's based on the, so that's, that's that first note is the, the five. So if I could find the five of, let's say F. Now I just learned it, I have it in multiple keys. That's good. Or if I played it in G. Let's find the five. Oh, I just messed myself up there. Let's do it up here. You know what I'm saying? Now I have the starting note of every one of these and I could play this in multiple keys. That's the reason why good. it's good in communication, but it's also good in understanding. Good. I feel like these are major keys that help progress me past, you know, just the root note is when you know the number system, learning the chords that correspond to it. Because I know keys players, y'all oh, y'all, yeah. know exactly what chords they are. <laughs> but for bass players, we just like, oh, it's just the six. Oh, it's just the four. But when you know it's, oh, four is a major. Oh, five is a major. Oh, he's playing a six minor seven. Now what you can start to do is use arpeggios. You can do little chords. You know, like, or just like, fine. You know arpeggios and stuff like that and create cooler licks and different things because 
you know what chord's being played. That's good. You know, if you're ever trying to break past that, I would definitely suggest doing that and learning them. So good. And that's really important because knowing your inversions is so important for bass to flip oh, a song yeah. completely. Playing that one <laughs> over three, you can totally flip a song on its head, you know, take it to a whole new level. Some of the best bass players are keys players. <laughs> and the reason why is because they realize the power of the bass note. Mm. And so like, if you realize the power of the bass note, bass becomes way more fun for you. Right. <laughs> you oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. if I play, if you played an A and then I played a C sharp, you know, like, or, if, you know, or if you played an A and I played a F sharp, you know, you're playing like right. an A on your right hand. I could change the way that chord feels just because I'm changing my bass. Yes. You know, and it just it makes for creative and cool moments. And that that whole technique right there is called substitutions. If you're yes. looking up, if you're trying to find out what to look up, it's called substitutions. Keyboard players Absolutely. do all the time. The last thing somebody told me this years ago changed my life when it comes to bass. They said if you want to get better at bass, learn what the piano player is doing. Mm. So if there is any one piece of advice that it, you want, if you're intermediate and you try to get advanced or a beginner trying to get intermediate, learn what the piano player is doing and it will change your life. So I love that you said that the substitutions <laughs> are so important. And that's, and you can see right there, that's a piano player right there. You're learning so much theory that you didn't even, <laughs> you didn't even know about as a bass player. Like I didn't know that until I talked to a piano player and I was like, oh, that's, a, oh, okay. Cause I heard a bass player do that before and I was just like, what is happening? Right. What am I feeling right now? This right. is insane. <laughs> and then I find out that that's a piano technique. And I was like, what? What I started doing is re looking up certain piano, gospel piano progressions and gospel yeah. piano movements or jazz piano movements or whatever. And that was kind of how I started to learn, okay, oh, they're playing a bit. The bass is this and the bass is this. Ah, uh, you know, that's then good. it starts to get in your head and that kind of breaks you out of that. Passing chords are not just a piano thing, but it's a bass thing. Mm. And so like whenever I come up with a, a, a line or something, if you hear somebody do like, you know, you could do like a lick. And basically the way I came up with that is just following a chord progression. So. You know, and I'm just doing arpeggios. Yeah. You know, like you can kind of just start to create new licks and new vocabulary just based off of following passing chord progressions. So you good. You know what I'm saying? So good. Well, so. Travis Dykes on the Worship Keys podcast today. You can connect with him on Instagram. You can definitely connect with him on YouTube as well. He has new videos at least twice a month. There's wonderful <laughs> videos for bass players. Also would benefit for keys players as well. Some really cool <laughs> grooves that you could take from what he did, put it on the, in the keys world. So really, really cool stuff. Thank you, Travis, for being on the podcast, Thank man. Thank you for having and me. And please tell us, how can we, tell us about your book. What's the name of your book again? It's called Do It Yourself Bass Guitar, as in collaboration with Hal Leonard. So cool. And so, yeah, it's basically a book for anybody who wants to go from not knowing anything about playing the bass to be able to play bass in a band. Where can they get that book, man? You can get it really pretty much anywhere books are sold. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, any anywhere you can online, even the Hal Leonard so website as well. well. We'll have a link on the description for YouTube and also in the show notes for podcasts so you can get that book if you want awesome. to. So thank you again, Travis, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you all for watching The Worship Keys.